And I will now turn it over to Bibhu, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Daphne. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Professor Trevor Lever. I hope I got the pronunciation right. His talk to us would be on science and Arctic exploration from Ross to Mayers and Kilben in the 19th century. We are indeed fortunate to have him find the time for us to address our gathering. Therefore, after completing his D field at Oxford, he moved to U of T in 1968 and where he has spent his entire academic career. He retired finally as the director of the Institute of Institute for History and Philosophy of Science and Technology till 1998. He's a prolific author over a wide variety of subjects from chemistry, history of chemistry, and equipment development, a strange combination, and in general history of science, unlike most of us involved in our very narrow specialties, therefore can be likened to be a truly Renaissance scholar. He's a prolific author and a member of the Royal Society of Canada and member of several other distinguished societies, including the Royal Dutch Society of Sciences. With that introduction, I'll now leave it to Daphne. I was working on 19th century chemistry and Humphrey Davy. Davy was friends with Coleridge. Coleridge sucked me in and I found myself working under Kathleen Coburn on the Coleridge notebooks. At the end of that research, I knew two things. One, I didn't want to read any more German metaphysics for a long time. And two, I had a book on Coleridge that I did want to write. Coleridge and my own hobbies led me to look at the history of natural history. And through that, I got interested in the role of science in the exploration of the Canadian Arctic. Uh, and that's where it comes from, and I'm not sure where it's going. The clearest map of the circumpolar Arctic is Unsurprisingly, one constructed by the CIA and more surprisingly, it's a readily available atlas. You can see a fairly substantial Arctic Ocean surrounded for the most part by land masses, continents and islands. And that's a complete map as far as the outline of boundaries go. The red line that so meanders around like a very deformed circle is the 10 degrees Celsius isotherm for July, which is their arbitrary definition of what constitutes the Arctic, anything on or above that. The general image of the Arctic through the late 18th into the early 19th century was uh, 
somewhat imaginative, almost completely uninformed. This is a later illustration by Doré of an episode from Coleridge's Rome of the Ancient Mariner. Uh, faint like that. At the end of the Napoleonic Wars, there was a problem, or rather there were several problems. What do you do with the soldiers and sailors who were in full-time work? You pension off the officers on half pay, you tell the troops otherwise just get lost. And there was a fair amount of activity in the army and the navy trying to find jobs for the boys. The Ordnance Survey, a superb mapping enterprise in Great Britain, started for that reason to give jobs. Uh, and the navy was not going to be left out. They wanted to map a Northwest Passage. They wanted to map the Polar Ocean. It was geographical, but the Navy was quite convinced that it was sorely needed. And the people who counted, including John Barrow, who was second secretary, were obliging enough to say, yes, this is important. They pushed it. And the first of the just get rid of that. The first of the post-Napoleonic War Royal Naval Expeditions was one led by John Ross. Ross was inventive, imaginative, tough, undisciplined, and overweight. Some of those qualifications would help him, some would not. Going the wrong way. The expedition he went on had a scientific mandate as well as a geographical one. They wanted to know what the sea bottom was, where it was shallow. They wanted to know how the magnetic compass varied as it got nearer and nearer the magnetic pole. They wanted to know a bit about northern lights. They wanted experiments with the second pendulum, which could give you information about the shape of the Earth. It's not a sphere, it's squashed. Uh, and they needed to quantify that. This gadget is one of Ross's own manufacture, but if you walk down to the harbour front in Toronto, you will see a couple of large platforms and from those platforms, cranes are lowering assorted things into the ooze. And some of them look very much like Ross. I don't know if he ever took a patent out on it, but he was an enthusiastic, if not very sophisticated painter. And this muskox, this Arctic fox, and this Arctic Highlander were all Ross's sketches. Um, Arctic Highlander is a very curious name. As far as I can tell, they weren't living in the highlands. The only thing could be high latitudes. But Ross, unlike officers before and after him, made some effort to get to know the Inuit. He learned something of their language. He was able to discuss roots with them uh, and currents and basically survival. Uh, and it was a very profitable enterprise. Ross commanded an expedition which was blocked by ice in one direction. So he came south a bit and turned left, hoping to go through Barren Straits. And right across the street, he saw very clearly a range of mountains. Nobody else on the ship admitted to seeing them. 
And I do not think Ross was lying. If you've ever seen a Fata Morgana in high latitudes, the illusion of rocks, plateaus, spikes, it, it doesn't change very quickly as you look at it. If you combine that with just a little bit of fog coming in, in and out, it would be completely convincing. And I am quite clear that Ross was not lying, but his reception when he got back home was that he had chickened out and had ignored the fact that no one else saw this, so it couldn't be real. And he never got command of a major Royal Naval expedition again. This Crookshank cartoon has a few, well, very odd things. Here is one of the Inuit, known as an Arctic Highlander. Uh, there is another one, somewhat more elegantly dressed. The great bear, of course, is both in the heavens and in the fur. There is a bucket of red snow collected on the way. There, there are algae which color the snow red in northern latitudes. They, they're not everywhere, but they are very striking. And then there were no oh, mollusks for the British Museum, puppies and huskies and red snow and oh, bears, gulls and more savages. The, the, the caption indicates that these were simply not necessary. We had enough gulls and savages already in the UK. You didn't need to go to the Arctic for them. And I won't try to sing the song which is written on the left, but it begins, Oh, Captain, he is come to town, doodle, doodle, dandy. And that's the captain with his curious nose. That expedition overlapped with one carried out by John Franklin. Um, John Franklin is remembered for the Franklin expedition. There's nothing like a total disaster to attract attention and keep it. But in fact, he had three Arctic expeditions. This one was, this portrait was made just after his return from his first expedition. He was headed for the shores of the Polar Sea by going up the Coppermine River. He had 20 men at the outset. He had nine men when he got back. Seven of those nine had died of starvation. One of them had been killed and eaten by the last man who was convicted and executed by the surgeon, John Ross. And had they not been rescued by a chief of Chipulian Indians, I think it more than likely that the loss would have been total. So this was a really unsuccessful expedition. It didn't bring back much useful information. It lost more than half the men on the expedition. And so, of course, Franklin was recognized as the ideal man to carry on with northern and Arctic exploration. The logic of the Admiralty is sometimes really worrisome. There, was, there were three years spent in North America, northern Canada, touching on the Arctic. and really very handsome books of natural history came out of it. Uh, and the names reflected the officers on board. Richardson's, no, parasitic Jaeger, Franklin's Gull, 
Sabine's girl, which was called Xeme then, and I have no idea why. I've tried to look it up and I'm bewildered. Sabine was the man, he was the Royal Artillery officer, not a naval officer. He was in charge of the pendulum observations and of a good deal more geophysics, including geomagnetic work. And in later years, he came to be the British spokesman for the magnetic crusade where across the globe, coordinated observations with the same instruments were carried out uh, and gave us a huge amount of information. At the beginning, I think he was more keen on the birds than the magnets. They got to the Arctic Ocean. It's um, looking at this, I think probably not the ideal vacation spot for a canoe. But nobody was killed. At the end of the expedition, the map of British North America was somewhat incomplete. Some of the rivers were there, some of the coast, but mostly what is striking is how little was known. I should say a little about the Natural History and Franklin's Expedition beyond the handsome volumes. Richardson was a really good ornithologist and he had professional help when he got back to produce the bird volume. A volume which didn't appear as a volume but merely as a series of papers was one made by the botanist on the expedition, Thomas Drummond. Drummond was a Scot who drank heavily and was unhappy at living at home with his wife. So whenever he could get an offer of long distance travel, no matter what the circumstances, he would undertake it and the drinking would stop instantly. He was indefatigable. He got separated at one point from the expedition had to winter in the Rockies with about half his equipment, was helped, of course, by the local Indians. Uh, when he was with the expedition, he would be up at four in the morning, having an early breakfast. Then from five to eight, he would be botanizing on land, keeping up with the, with the ship, getting back to the, not ship, freighter canoe writing up his notes until late and then up at four the next morning. And he kept this going. And then at the end of the expedition, he landed by arrangement on the shores of Hudson's Bay and was botanizing in the muskeg along the bay. A storm came up. He and the two sailors who were with him were blown out into the middle of the bay they had no food and they were not well dressed for what the weather was doing. They struggled back and the two who were helping Drummond took to their beds and stayed there until they got back to England. Drummond went botanizing the next day in the muskeg and his diary records went 15 miles, unaccountably tired, returned to ship. And I don't think his diary was for consumption by anyone but himself anyway. Oh, and, and a footnote, when he was sent out by William Hooker, who became the director of Kew Gardens in Surrey, Hooker had said, while you're in North America, keep a lookout for Douglas, Douglas of the Furs, because he's going to be botanizing in North America too, and you may well meet. Uh, and I thought, oh yes, they did meet.
after the first two Franklin searches, not searches, expeditions, after a number of other minor expeditions, the detail on the map and what is known has improved significantly, but it's still a, an entirely unhelpful map because there is just so much of it that nobody knows anything about. Greenland doesn't have a northern coast. Most of the Arctic archipelago isn't known. Russian coast is pretty limited. It's, uh, well, it's an admission of ignorance. Now, John Franklin, we get, uh, we're getting to 1845. He is about to lead what everyone knows as the Franklin expedition. And it wasn't terribly successful. He's 59 years old. He has been the Lieutenant Governor of Tasmania, of Tasmania in Australia, where he was very unpopular. He had one absolutely disastrous job behind him, the first Franklin expedition. And yet, Arctic officers who knew him said that he was the best man for the job and added, and what is more, if he doesn't get it, the disappointment will kill him in the circumstances that might not have been a bad thing. He was well supplied, strong ships, food for over two winters. Information about my caches of food had been left by previous, previous officers and ships. And he was well equipped in every way. Navigational equipment, scientific equipment, armaments. Well, nobody worries when somebody has gone away for two years with supplies for more than two years. But by 1857, people worked well, sorry, I said 57, 1847. He's beginning to realize that life has got difficult to the point that he dies. And over the next few months, so do the rest of his men. The ships have been recovered since. Franklin searches were many. I haven't counted them, but they have to be at least 40. This group never ever met. It is the Arctic Council and it presents the leading figures who were involved in guiding and recommending the Franklin searches. There's John Richardson, the only one who looks remotely modern to my eye. There is Edward Sabine, who's become almost skeletal, but will go on for another 30 years doing good work. There's Beaufort, the hydrographer. The, the Beaufort scale of winds is something that many of you will know. There's William Edward Perry. It, these are high powered guys. The fact that this is a composite picture made from other portraits doesn't detract from the fact that they were all involved. And up here, not terribly clearly, you may just recognize Captain John Franklin. Now, 
So, John Franklin. They pushed in 1847 to 1849. John Richardson, whom we've met twice, and John Ray essentially led, but were the overland search. And they didn't find evidence of Franklin's past. Ray went there again in 1850 and again in 1855. And on the last trip, his correspondence, his meetings with and exchanges with the Inuit made it clear to him that the expedition had all perished and that they had resorted to cannibalism. He reported this back to London, and he was not in good favor for the rest of his life because British gentlemen don't resort to cannibalism. The Royal Navy has had enough. It calls off further searches as too expensive and too unproductive. But Jane Franklin, she doesn't know that she is John's widow, but she is. Jane Franklin is a one woman whirlwind of fundraising and persuasion. She seeks private funding when the Navy says, really, no, we've spent too much already, go away. And donors include the beautifully named Felix Booth, who is the gin magnet of Booth's gin, it's the same family still. He puts money in and for example, John Ross sails in a ship, Felix, named after him. And the map becomes dotted with Felix Booth's name. There's Boothia Felix, there's the Boothia Peninsula, and it goes on. This is a picture of John Ross, just at about the age when he was setting out on his unsuccessful but well-managed expedition. It's by Thackeray, and although the detail is not very clear, it is a portrait of Sir John Ross eating an iceberg. This sketch by Ross is not at the right time. It's from an earlier expedition. But Ross made the practice, had made then and continued to make now, friends and good use of Inuit and their knowledge. Um, it took a little bit to work things out when it came to reading maps, because we go by compass bearing and distance, and they go by compass bearing of the sun, and time, if it takes three days to get somewhere, and you cover two miles, it's a three day walk, whereas for the Navy, it would be a two day walk and that. I think the Inuit attitude to the difficulty of travel, excuse me, has a lot more sense to it than the projections, but it's interesting that both the Inu and the officers learned to interpret one another's drawings and maps and were able to get coherent advice and to give it, uh, and also to learn of an, a shipwreck from an earlier Franklin disaster, except for that one 
the crew got home just crowding onto the next door boat. Um, but the supplies for another winter were there. And so this kind of meeting was enormously fruitful. Once you've got the Franklin searches out of the way, you can look still at the map of the world, or rather the map of the Northwest. And there are lots more names, and there are some more lines, but still to me the overwhelming impression is how little is known. I said that uh, Ray came back with messages about cannibalism. He did. And he was metaphorically pilloried for it. But the attitude towards Arctic exploration by the Navy soured, or at least faded. Uh, and this painting by Landseer expresses, I think, all the horrors. The bear on the right is crunching a human rib cage. The bear on the left is pulling on a British flag that appears to have been dipped in blood. There's blood behind on the ground. There's a telescope behind on the ground. And it's not a very promising place. Change of pace and part two of this talk. Thanks to the Royal Navy and the Admiralty. There have been no Royal Naval Arctic expeditions since the Franklin searches. And whenever anyone asked what about another search, they got a very crusty and short reply saying, already considered, already rejected. But there was a region in which scientific exploration of the sea really worked. And that was the South Pacific getting towards the Atlantic. You may well have heard of the Challenger expedition. It was a big hydrographic, zoological, oceanographic, everything, meteorological push. And uh, incidentally, not minor in the long run, but minor at the time. Thomas Henry Huxley was a junior zoologist on that expedition. And what he found and wrote up made his name famous and gave him the credentials to become the second most well-known zoologist in Britain after Darwin. Nares, Captain George Strong Nares, was in command of HMS Challenger. They came north to Hong Kong to restock, and Nares found waiting for him instructions to go directly and as fast as possible to London, where he would be fitted out with two ships to go to the high Arctic. There's a minor political joke going on here. Gladstone had been asked about Arctic exploration by every scientific society. The Linnaean Society, for example, had said that Arctic exploration is perfectly safe, with the exception of the Franklin disaster, and there were special explanations for that. None of the fellows of the Linnaean Society had been injured, let alone killed. Whereas all the fellows of the Linnaean Society who had gone to Africa had died. So if you're going to put money into anything, you'll get greater survival 
greater reward from the Arctic. Gladstone just said, no, flatly, no. And then he sent the expedition to the South Oceans, theirs and the Challenger expedition. And when Disraeli came into power, you could just see him smiling malevolently and saying, well, that's what Gladstone wanted. I think I'll turn it round and appointed theirs to lead the Northern Expedition. Theirs was a Navy man. He said, yes. On the way up, on the journey north, the lime juice was handed out to all the sailors, including the officers, not including the dogs. It had been a staple on Captain Cook's expeditions. In fact, Cook said that anyone who failed to take their lime juice would be whipped. Uh, which is a fairly good way of encouraging them to take it. It's a pity it was lime juice. Lime isn't as good an antiscorbutic as lemon juice is, but it's still not trivial and it's still useful. Going up the route up the west coast of Greenland, gradually gets hemmed in by the encroachment of, Wellsmere, of Ellesmere Island on the west. And these are the last steps in the naval expedition. HMS Discovery stayed in Lady Franklin Bay over winter. I should do this. And they went on up to the Alerts Winter Quarters. Uh, HMS Alert wintered there. The military and meteorological station called Alert is named obviously after that ship. Expeditions went across the Robeson Channel into Greenland. They went up and down the coast and they pushed north on the ice, very broken ice, to see how close to the pole they could get. Fielden was the naturalist, and he worked quite intensely. This is the Fielden Peninsula, but quite intensely about everywhere that he would get to within two days' march, going with a tent. Henry, and I'm trying to remember Henry's inner name, and it will come when I don't need it. Um, and he would be geologizing, taking samples of water for microscopic analysis, uh, doing autopsies on anything that died around. Uh, his natural history was pretty comprehensive. But what he was really good at was geology. I think ornithology gave him greater pleasure, but geology is where his work has been the best available until the 1950s. And this is the 1870s, so he's good. This map, incidentally, also, it's worth pointing out that it's from my edition of there's Arctic Journal in HMS Alert, and it is a false proof. The cartographers were very long suffering and were as eager as I was to get it right. Uh, and I'm really impressed with their work. going backwards apparently. 
There are some photographs of Fielden, the naturalist on HMS Alert. Um, this is one from the, when he was 89, 59 and had recently re retired. Before that, he had fought in just about every available war. He had been, well, he ran the blockade and joined the Confederate forces in the United States, the Southern States, and fought for them. And it's quite clear that he thought that the slaves would not be able to cope except with our direction. He is perfectly comfortable with slave masters. He was involved in the military rescue of Cornwall when he was just a teenager. And that insurrection and its aftermath left some horrendous sights. And he's scarred by it. It's the only military engagement that he ever writes about. Uh, and Well, the, the Indian insurrection or rebellion, hard to call it a mutiny when it's so forcefully a system imposed on them and they're trying to shrug it off. Fielding, in spite of that, and being a good burger and a good shot and a good man with a fly rod, was also enormously energetic. And with the one exception, he managed to be on good terms with everybody on the expedition. The one exception was Moss, Edward Lawton Moss, who thought that he should have been the naturalist officially. And was, well, dismissive of Fielden and that there are pages in Fielden's journal where he has just either cut a paragraph out or used heavy Indian ink to blot out all the words. And from the very little I've been able to make sense of looking through this blacked out stuff, these are where his complaints are most serious about Dr. Moss. I think at the beginning he didn't realize that the journal was going to be the property of the Admiralty. When he did, he went back and, uh, well, there are, there are some redactions and some editing going on. Geological notes on the west side going up. You can see the strata, they do mean something. Disco is on the west side of Greenland. It's probably the biggest settlement on that coast and the ships touched in there for a while, uh, partly to take on translators, you know, translators, and dog drivers. The Royal Navy wasn't good at languages, clearly, and it wasn't good at dogs. And the Inno could do both, you know, it up through Baffin's Bay, July the 30th, to, sorry, June the 30th, the first iceberg seen with HMS Discovery tilting away from it. The beat twill, which I gather is rarely seen, I learned only today that they can go down to a thousand feet and that they can stay down for up to five hours. The toothed whales, which makes me think sperm whales, but then, well, it's an unusual sighting. Every so often when the ships slowed enough and the bottom was shallow, they'd throw out nets and dredges and bring up 
curious sea creatures. This is a kind of sea cucumber, a halosaurian. That's a very delicate creature. You can't botanize when you're on board, but when the ship stops to, to repair a damaged propeller, for example, which was the case in this instance, then Fielden and one other were allowed to go botanizing. And it's not easy to make these out, but they are the names of fairly common Arctic flowers. Lady Franklin Bay. Discovery is going to be iced in, spend the winter there, and does not suffer anything terrible. Alert goes further up and tucks in at what they called Floberg Beach. Floberg is a giant ice flow that's pushed up over the others onto the shore, and it gives you a real jumble and jungle. It also gives protection, if they're in the right place, protection for the ship from what's happening at sea. This is the ship covered over for, night, for, for winter activities. So there's a tent over the main deck. There's a chain with at intervals pillars which you can't see. But when the weather is essentially blind and the men still need to go out for exercise, they follow the chain, not using their hands. This photograph, I have no idea whether it was distant for a jigsaw puzzle or what. Um, but here's an individual. And there is a bit of the masts of HMS Alert. Flubergs were big, is all that means to me. Arctic expeditions. through the Arctic winters have a problem of dealing with boredom. The ship set up a printing office and they printed programs of self-improvement, lectures, field lectures on geology. Uh, they had musical evenings where everyone was expected to sing, or if they didn't sing, they'd better paint the stationery or do something constructive. Uh, and since this was every Thursday and needed preparation, it took up a good deal of what would have been the slack time. If you're stuck, on the ice in the far north, one of the things that you can do is carry out geomagnetic observations. This instrument is one developed at Kew, but there was an observatory at Kew Gardens. And it gives you a measure of the magnetic declination and force. And it must be boring as places because if you're doing the job properly, and they did, you are taking records every 15 minutes for most of the time, and then every two minutes for an hour through the 24 hours. Obviously, they get relieved. It's in an igloo, uh, an ice house, because no metal must get near it. That would throw the needle off. And just about every scientific expedition to back to the Arctic had this kind of apparatus and this kind of house. So it's, uh, well, almost a template. This is an instrument that was on HMS Alert. It measures dip the uh, 
needle wants to point horizontally to wherever the magnetic pole appears to be, but it also is pulled down because the Earth's magnetism has a vertical component as well as a horizontal one. Um, this instrument is pretty foolproof, but not on this occasion. Somebody dropped it and the axis was broken. The ship's armorer made a replacement and they went back to making observations with this instrument, but they didn't re-standardize it, recalibrate it, because with a new axle, it's simply not the same instrument. With the result, since they didn't indicate this in their record, that except for the earliest and latest reports, it's a dead loss, kind of a pity because it's a neat instrument. And it was developed by Fox with encouragement and input from John Franklin. After the winter, the sun does come back and it's possible to read the newspaper outside, even the small print. The officers would take copies of the Times out at intervals on moonless and moonlit nights and see how bright it was. This, unfortunately, was almost obligatory. They had some salt pork, some salt beef, but fresh meat was enormously attractive and helpful and healthier too. And the only sizable fresh meat that you could get, I mean, you could shoot as many swans or ducks or geese as you wanted, but the muskox was really the prime target. Their habit of standing in a circle facing out with the young at the middle meant that you could just about walk up to them and shoot them. And even the sailors recognized by the end of the expedition that they had gone a long way towards exterminating the muskox from that part of its range. More geologizing, you can see here and here that Fielden has put himself in, but these are technical notes that get worked up into the scientific papers. End of a long day. Not sure what's in the decanters, but uh, writing up the log and writing up notes for papers was a routine part. Uh, and I am surprised not to see a pipe or a cigar in either mouth there. They wanted to get to the North Pole. They wanted to see if there was an open polar sea. It seemed ridiculous, but serious geographers had posited that possibility. The Royal Navy can get help from Inuit, but it doesn't trust Inuit help with dogs for long treks. And if you, this is not an exaggerated diagram, I've seen much worse ones. They're manholing the sledges over pressure ridges and ice falls. And it's really killing work. This is as far as they got. Albert Hastings Markham was the leader of the sledging group, group that went out northwards across the ice. The one thing that they could prove was that there was no open polar sea. The other thing that they proved unwittingly and unhappily was that you really do need lime or even better lemon juice when you're doing that kind of work. 
the evidence that it was helpful was abundant and clear, and it had been recommended by the Surgeon General. But there were plenty of overland sledging expeditions where man-hauling had been the order of the day and were covering five or eight hundred miles each way without lime or lemon had not produced scurvy. So I think it may have something to do with not eating raw meat. I don't know what happens to vitamin C when you cook it. But of this party, three were able to stand by the time they got back. The rest were on sledges being helped along by the three who were near the end of their trip. It, uh, that experience persuaded Les to go home in 76 rather than in 77. And it was a decision greeted with great relief by everyone. There had been deaths from scurvy on board the ship, on the sledging expeditions, uh, and they didn't want any more of it. When Nairs and his crew got back to England, the naval responses were a bit mixed. There were some who thought he'd done a magnificent job. Uh, I don't recall when he was knighted, but maybe before then, but certainly the knighthood was appropriate. He had held his crew together. He'd gone further north than any expedition before him. He brought back a huge variety of fossils and rock samples. And altogether, an expedition with valuable results. The other side said he'd had his instructions about lime juice. He had ignored them, and men had died because of it, and he should be court martialed. Uh, he was not court martialed. Fielden, with thousands of specimens of plants, of birds, of animals, of insects, and assorted geology, was very busy when he got back. He had friends in the British Museum who would go over the geological work with him and write it up with him was important. Ditto in ornithology, uh, ditto in paleontology. But he kept the control as his own. And that led to a blow up with the president of the Royal Society. Joseph Dalton Hooker was, as even his close friends, Darwin, for example, said, given to being irascible. He was cross that Fielden had not given him everything as soon as he landed, and more or less abused Fielden as, as having betrayed trust and done them all of the work he'd been attracted for. Uh, Fielden wrote back and said, in that case, I can only say that I will do no further work for the Royal Society. I am working for the Navy, and I'm their man. And when that is finished, I will complete their results and send them where they tell me. Explosion. Uh, and then the usual climb down field and was asked what it would take to get him to get on good terms again with Hooker. And he said a written apology would be nice. Uh, 
and after that I would not mind exchanging letters so that we each keep the one we'd written. He got his written apology and Hooker became one of his strongest supporters. I think he and Nez were the two who nominated Fielden for Fellowship in the Royal Society, which he didn't get, but which he deserved compared with many who did get it. And come the First World War, he's still a soldier. He's quartermaster, he's drilling with the recruits, but he's not going to fields of combat. You tend not to do that in your 80s. I'll stop. Thank you.